Welcome to my Commodore 64 Games Memories. This is where I look at old games and some of the technical details behind them. Let's get into it. Today we have Exile, published in 1991 by Audiogenic, coded by Jeremy Smith and Peter Irvin, and also the graphics were by Jeremy and Peter, and the title screen was by Paul Doherty. I'm going to be looking at the disc version today, so we can see here that the disc version shows this little splash screen and then it goes into the loading screen and then it's got a relatively fast load and we can see here that it's actually showing in the debug character screen view there in the top right -hand corner there. It's actually showing some countdown values but it goes into negative numbers and it prefixes this counting down number with different characters so it kind of indicates that it doesn't know the total amount of kilobytes that it needs to load or it's not displaying that correctly but that's because it's hidden behind the bitmap now the game starts straight away into this starting screen and there's no real title screen or anything like this in this version anyway the the enemy I think teleported away with the destinator or something like that which you're meant to go and fight through this maze of uh, background uh, maze of levels and solving puzzles and then get the destinator back so then you can use your ship anyway so I noticed straight away when I was playing this game way back in the day that it actually had a very special graphics mode but I didn't quite know the extent of its specialness so we're going to have a look at this today and I because I, I want to really go through the technical details on how this game manages to have such good graphical variation in actually what is in a text screen mode. It's not using bitmap, although when we delve into it a little bit more we'll see that it's not just a normal screen mode. I want to thank everyone who suggested this game actually because uh, it was a good little insight. So looking at this we can see straight away that actually it's using a single buffer screen and it's got this weird repeating pattern. Top left hand corner of the debug view here. If I use the cursor keys to move the screen around which is a great feature of this game. I'm playing it on keyboard not the joystick. We can see it's actually scrolling this these four repeating chunks of characters left and right. Now when I say repeating chunks, it's basically repeating what looks like a 64 character wide chunk for four lines and then repeating that every four lines. We can also see that the graphics map has a very few number of sprites in there. So what is going on in this game? If it's just scrolling a repeated chunk of four repeating rows of characters then this means that we must have more than one character set being uh, visible on, at the same time on this text screen so let's delve into this a little bit more now i'm just looking for the score panel and also what's interesting to note here is that the game display doesn't have the usual six or eight uh, blank raster lines where it transitions from a scrolling screen to a static score panel. It's just got this very neat, very narrow gap between the scrolling area and the score panel. I think we can guess at the moment that it's not, it's probably not using the Y hardware pixel scroll, but it looks like it is using the X hardware pixel level scroll for the screen but it's also scrolling the characters, of course, which you have to do for every eight pixels. But look, this repeating pattern of four lines of characters is actually using one, two, three, four, five separate character sets. And the character set at 5,000 displays the, uh, the top of the little spaceship that you're in with its top of the rocket booster. The uh, next character set down and the next character set down is actually laid out for the rest of the for the Vic Bank, and this doesn't. This means that we don't actually have a lot of space for different sprites. 
because most of it is actually filled with character sets. We can see as I move through these repeating ro four rows of characters are actually rendering different parts of the spaceship. This is the top part where the stars are, then we've got the top part of the spaceship here. So we must be having some kind of interrupt or, or code somewhere storing into D018, which is the VIC register, the video chip register, which tells the video chip which character set to use at a particular point on the screen. And we must be updating this at least five times. That's what I reckon. That's why I put a breakpoint on uh, the watch store D018 command there. So we can see here, look, this is a dead giveaway. So it's storing A into D018 here, but it's prefixed with a whole bunch of no ops. These no ops are useful because they can be used to time the update for this. So it's obviously trying to time the update at a point where it's not actually having any visible characters on the screen. We can also see it's updating D023, which is actually one of the multicolor character registers. So the, these no ops here are used to precisely time the update to the VIC chip registers so that we do not get any flickery effects or we try and avoid flickery effects. Now what's interesting to note as well is that uh, things like sprites can alter the timing, things like the band line which is where the VIC chip fetches the next row of characters to display can also affect the timing so this is why it's doing a compare and then it's doing a branch on carry set and doing a branch on carry clear to avoid different numbers of no ops to, to alter the precise timing. What I'm doing here is that I'm going to be adding a, a, an increment D020 just before it's changing the character set and look at that. We can see at all of the positions where it is changing the character set. I'm just adding a note for that the people who don't have the volume turned up. So we have these updates to the screen for the character set to display. And if I scroll up and down, you can see that these lines, these bars move up and down in sync with the different four character rows bands of different character sets. Now, because there are 256 characters, and because we've got four rows, that means that there's up to, horizontally, 64 characters that can scroll left and right. Yeah, D0223 uh, is one of the background color, uh, one of the multi one of the character multicolor um, updates. Anyway, so this means that the game, when it scrolls up and down, it looks like if I uh, if we watch the character sets, and I've been watching the character sets before on this, when the sc when the screen scrolls up and down, in addition to changing the position at where the character set splits are, it scrolls the character screen. Okay, so that helps to scroll it up and down, but it calculates the new screen visible area into one of the character sets. So actually, if you wanted to scroll this screen up or down by four character rows, all you have to do is change which character set is visible at which particular place going down the screen. So actually, it's very quick and easy to scroll up and down. <clears throat> so it's, it's only introducing new data into the bare minimum of the character set that it needs to be able to scroll new data into the screen vertically. And because the, the virtual screen, if you like, is 64 characters wide rather than 40 characters which are visible on the screen, we've got some overlap left and right where the game has what looks like some spare time that it's able to update all of this extra character data when it's scrolling. And I'm going to show that when I'm I'm going to think I'm going to move the, the, the player character 
around a bit so you can see that. I'm just removing the the border update here. So I tried to make it store the actual character set as a colour <laughs> and, and the game restored back um, uh, D023 so yeah. Now it actually should be store X D023 right remember from the code previously not store A so that's why the game colours look a little bit strange now <laughs> which is quite funny. So actually I made the game look weirdly extra colourful uh, by storing uh, the wrong colours. So the game uses this um, multicolour character update as well to, to basically introduce nice uh, extra colours on a horizontal band basis depending on where you are scrolling. Uh, within the level. So if, we, if I scroll around, look, you can see here in the character sets there's like a caching mechanism going on where the virtual lines are, are pre-computed so that when the characters screens shift left and right the, the scrolling can actually be done relatively quickly because it doesn't have to keep on calculating new data for every row that is introduced to the left and to the right, it's actually looking like it's calculating 8 to 12 characters in a chunk. So it's only when you're scrolling extremely quickly consistently in one direction, then the, the game kind of does a lot of extra work. And you can see here, when you're flying through the space and through the stars, the stars are actually updated as specific pixels into the different character sets. And also the the explosions, the uh, jetpack uh, pixels. If I scroll, if I move around, you can see the pixels for the jetpack being rendered into the character sets straight away. And in, and in the debug view, you can see because it's repeating those four rows. You can see if I get the jetpack pixels to go into the right place, you can see the jetpack pixels of all the stars appearing, there we go, there's the stars, in those repeated character rows there. So yes, the scrolling in this game is special. The scrolling in this game I think does it like this because it has a very large complex map with a lot of variation and I think the programmers wanted to retain as much variation in the map as possible and you know, there, I think there are many more than 256 characters of, of distinct uh, d distinct characters within this map. So I think that's why it's able to extract this information. And I think this information is stored compressed in memory as well. So it's able to decompress those characters and then put them into the character set on a dynamic basis. And it's the same with the sprites. You'll notice that as I'm moving the character around, the what were what was that looked like you know uh, spare data or something like that in the sprite definitions now you can see the sprite definitions actually contain a lot of extra frames and that's because these extra frames are copied in on an as needed dynamic basis and i think that this is like the cache if you like you can you can consider the game basically using a character set cache for the screen scroll and also a sprite cache for the sprite frames which uh, other games do that as well do you? I don't know but, uh, let's see the last ninja games uh, definitely use uh, compressed sprite caches for this and, and this game definitely does the same kind of thing because if I scroll down here then uh, if I can get rid of this door now the door, uh, I think I can blow it up with uh, the grenade. So let's just stop myself from dying here. Right. Let's also get rid of the flashy border because it's quite distracting, right? So let's aim over here. And that's the thing about this game is that it's keyboard controlled. And I've forgotten the keyboard controls. <laughs> oh yes, that's throw and that's drop. 
Okay, so there's the grenade. Let's hide over here, hopefully it doesn't hurt me. There you go, the door disappears. Now if I fly down here, uh, the sprite frames will update and the sprite frames for this kind of like cow walking thing down at the bottom of the screen get added to the cache. Let's try and push it off. Uh, no, let's not kill myself. That would not be a terribly good idea, right? So in this game, it's not really possible to kill yourself. You get teleported back to your remembered points and then if you keep on getting hurt you eventually get teleported back to your safe little spaceship. So let's fly back down here again. Look at that. Walking moo cow whatever it is you can see its frames have been added to the sprite cache. Here we go. And there we go. If I fly over here to the left, I believe that there's a gun, and the gun should get added again to the sprite cache. Because I think the gun is, is a sprite object, and there it is. Uh, towards the top right hand corner. If I fly down here. Okay, there's a vertical door. Uh, sometimes the sprites are vertically expanded or horizontally expanded for the doors especially uh, but there are other some uh, later on through this game if I remember rightly there are large walls and stuff like that which are also made up of expanded sprites I don't think this game really has a multiplexer per se uh, I, I don't think that the, that the game gets sufficiently busy for there to be a multiplexer I'm really interested in the uh, in the scrolling and, and the sprite caching mechanism in this one. So once you have the gun, uh, this gun especially, you can use it as kind of like a like a thing which pushes other objects out of the way. So this great big heavy thing uh, blocks your path up through here to the grenade. You can use that to actually get the grenade. Remember that from last time. I don't recall if I actually completed this game or not back in the day. It's very large and quite time consuming to play through. Uh, I did read obviously the, the, the playthroughs in the magazine and, and looked at the maps and everything. But it's very impressive this game. It, it, leaves a, it, it, it really leaves a lot, in the, a lot to the imagination. But it inspires the imagination as well. I, I spent ages trying to look for hidden nooks and crannies in this game. I spent ages trying to uh, manipulate the imps to do things that I wanted them to do, or the wasps as well, things like in the wasps nest. I found that if you could, you could get the birds, for example, to follow you and then knock you into places where you couldn't you normally get into because they could knock you through the gaps and all sorts all sorts of funny things that you could try and do to uh, get past bits in the game that you would normally find it quite difficult to get through you could squeeze through all sorts of little gaps in, in the level it didn't often help you but sometimes it did so yeah I used to spend hours playing this game many many hours but I don't recall if I ever completed it or not. I think I had the tape version, you know, to be honest. Uh, but this is the disc version. I don't think it auto-loaded. Uh, I think uh, I think the I think the file actually uh, was like a just a sys basic start. Yeah, the grenades blew up when I blew up the door. So one great thing about this game is that I think it's got a really quite flexible entity system. So I remember that you, there were some pokes to mess around with the inventory and to give you items that you wouldn't normally be able to get 
hold of. So let's see if we can find some of those pokes and see what we can find with the improved debugging capabilities of this. So uh, there's that poke there, which is this 39326. That's right. And that lets you pull different objects from your pockets. Now, it's not entirely consistent how this worked. So uh, say, for example, and then store the decibel value of 14 into this location and then you use what is it G to to get and there's a fish a large fish okay uh, what else is in my pockets I think the inventory has what four, four, four or five slots something like that uh, the next inventory slot would be I oh, know, let's have a look at what is in memory now. Uh, 393... Hmm, two. Yeah, this is the different memory location for the player character. I think 39326 is E at the moment because that's decimal 14. Right, and then I get a fish again. Okay. And then if I get another item, or well, if I put a different value in there, first of all, and then press G, oh look, you get an imp. <laughs> okay. Now the great thing is, that with this, it, it's better than having a freezer cartridge because this, with the machine code monitor and, and the data manipulation for the memory, uh, you can do a lot more. And you don't have to worry about the freezer cartridge uh, breaking the game so much. Because this game is actually quite finicky in terms of timing. And this game actually has some really quite difficult protection. If you start messing around with it uh, too much, it seemed to uh, detect that you were trying to do something weird with it and it, it stopped you from completing the game, if I remember rightly. Or was that the copy protection? I think that might be the copy protection. The copy protection kicks in. And basically the game is uncompletable at a particular point in time. So I found this lovely commented disassembly of the, I think it's the BBC version, BBC micro version. Now it says here that object zero E is a big fish. Okay. Uh, and the value 39326 putting decimal 14, which is zero E in there, definitely seemed to make me pull out a big fish from my inventory. 0E, you see. But, well, we'll see. It says 0E is a big fish. I think we need to experiment more with this because I remember that this poke was not reliable in its operation. Looking at this assembly, uh, dis the disassembly in the comments in this code, makes it seem as though uh, there is a, an object hierarchy system involved here where certain objects have a certain number of children that they can spawn. <clears throat> anyway, fish. But you see it's counted down. When I pulled out one item, the E turned to a D. And now it pulls out a completely different thing if I pull out another item from my pockets. And if I pull out another item from my pocket, it pulled out another game object. In this case, it looked like a duplicate of the player sprite. And I keep on dying because this one, this, this enemy, is quite violent. And I pulled out another player sprite there. So that's what I mean about this 
this inventory poke not being reliable. So I think it needs more investigation. Because look, I pulled out two more player surprise and then the game's crashed. Okay, so let's go back, I think, back to the uh, back to the snapshot that I saved earlier on. Load snapshot image. There we go. So let's do that poke again. And yeah, we can see that we got a grenade. Now we throw the grenade away. There's, there's, there's nothing more in the inventory. And look, 999E, which is, which is 39326, is now zero. I think it's a counter. Bing, 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 bing. Yeah, look, a whole bunch of player sprites. If I move around, they kind of follow me, but not in complete synchronization. This is what I mean about the game's entity system, is that if you spawn an object by pulling it out of your pocket of the same type as the player, then it seems to run the player update code more than once. And then the game crashes again. I don't think the game is really set up to handle so many simultaneous objects. Especially of the player code type, I imagine. I think it's probably getting a little bit confused. So there's the fish. And there's the counted down value from 0e to 0d. So if I pull out... Yes, it's definitely a count. Let's just add that comment there. So... Let's try pulling out another item from, from my pocket, perhaps. So, item. Bing. Okay. Go back into the debugger. Let's have a look again. It was D. Now it's C. This is definitely a counter, isn't it? It is not an object that's in your pocket. It's a counter probably an index into an array of well, or a stack but probably an array of items that are left in your pockets and if I'm over here and I'm getting I'm getting significantly hurt by by this thing running around or flying around at me I'm only playing a computer game. YouTube sensors, please don't remove my video. There we go. I'm back in the safety of my spaceship now. Although I have a feeling that other instances of the player that I spawned are potentially touching this inventory. Or maybe it's because I'm being blown up. Um, the e missiles are being fired at me or something and it's causing me to try and drop stuff that's in my inventory. I think that was a mechanic in the game, right? If you're hurt significantly, it drops things from, that you're carrying. Was it? I think, yes. So yeah, 999E. Mm. Yep. There we go. I'm do I'm doing a watch point basically on this what I know I know what I now know to be a counting down number. Mm, there seems to be other parts of the code which are uh, looking at this value. I don't know. Maybe there's a bug in the code which, under normal operation, doesn't do anything. But it seems to be um, accessing this memory location which seems to be a countdown value, but it's not altering it. It's not doing anything it just seems to be loading from it so I think there may be an unfound bug in this game code ah there we go load x with 999e branch on equal otherwise 
get the value from the array after 999e with the index. Aha! Uh -huh. And then probably go to an object spawn routine or something like that. You see, look, if the counter value in 999e is equal to zero, then skips over, goes to a, e, c, c, which just does a set carry and an r, an r, o, r, o, and an rts. Mm hmm. Okay. So, yes, it does. It looks like an inventory. It looks like an array of inventory values. But the inventory is only really meant to be four or five slots. So I think setting this 999e to be a value greater than 4 or 5 is definitely a no-no. I think that then it, it then causes it to start looping around into other data in or for other parts of the code, um, which would be a really, really bad thing. So yes, let's not set that to such a high value. You see, JSR to AD8B looks like probably, from the structure of the code, looks like something to allocate an object of a particular type which is held in the game data. And then if the carry is set, then that indicates that there was an error. Or it couldn't. And then it skips it. Otherwise, it stores X with FA, which is probably the index value of the new object that was just allocated and it probably does some second stage allocation or something with a a 5f is that's what they, you know if i was writing the code that's what the code would look like and i'm only judging my thoughts here my hypothesis on the structure of the code and, and, and the logical way in which it's laid out whoops so let's start the game again from scratch and see where 999e is actually updated. No, that's just the loader. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yes, it contains zero to be to begin with. But there are some non-zero values in the inventory there too. Hmm. Okay, so let's let's go pick up. We can't pick up the bird. I've tried. What we can do, however, is fly over here and pick up the grenade. There we go, and store it. And there we are. The breakpoint has hit as I press the store key. Uh, that's S, right on the keyboard. That's interesting. Look, store A, 999 uh, F, which is the start of, I'm guessing it's the start of the um, stack, if you like, for the inventory. Oh, look, and the code just above it moves all of the inventory slots over by one. <laughs> yeah, look, there is a load X with five, load A, previous, next, previous, next, previous, next. So yes, it's moving all of the inventory slots, shifting them over by one, and then storing the new object at the beginning, or the first slot, or the zeroth slot, of the inventory. <laughs> And it's updating a count of the number of items that are in the inventory as well. Adding items to the end in the inventory or shifting the items along in the inventory and then putting the beginning are two, you know, practically equally valid ways of doing it. I would have just put it at the end and updated the point, uh, updated the number of items and then just be done with it. But, you know, this game does it that way and it, it's what four or five different items five maybe five maybe and it's it's not too much execution time to to shift the items over so it looks like 68 is the grenade at least that's the number that comes up when uh, I'm storing the object in my pockets looking for grenade in here but 
in this code here, which is from the BBC Micro version, the grenade is object 12 in hex. Oh, that's the active grenade. Uh, where is the inactive grenade? Oh, there it is. Uh, five zero in hex. Hmm. So I don't think the object indexes or the object values in the Commodore 64 version are the same as the object values that are in the BBC Micro version. We'll see. We can probably do some experimentation about this. But yes, it's useful to to see how many objects there are actually in this other version. It's quite fantastic really, isn't it? Wow. And it's got all of those different pieces of code there as object handlers. Which is a really good, you know, a very, very nice, flexible entity system, actually. Anyway, so it's put 6, 8 into the inventory and it's incremented the number of objects in my inventory. So, I have an idea. Let's change the number of objects in my inventory to be, uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll err on the side of caution, we'll put four in there. And, or five, one, two, three, four, uh, yeah, we'll put four. So if I just change that, and let's put four, five different values into the actual inventory itself. There we go. So I've updated it now to look like this. We should diff see uh, different objects being pulled out of my pocket. Okay, out of my inventory slots. So, Let's teleport somewhere safe, and then let's delete the breakpoint for the inventory update. That was on the get object that I just pressed there, I pressed G. Oh look, I have a, what on earth is that? Is that fluffy? Yes it is, it's fluffy, gosh, okay. So at least one of the objects early on is Fluffy. Okay, that's cool. We know that we should have got Fluffy at some point in the, in the first few objects, assuming that the object list is consistent. That looks like a crew member. If I drop it, it doesn't fly around like, there we go. It's a crew member. The, the status update message came along at the, the bottom. It's a robot. I'm guessing that this is called Active Chatter. I don't know what Chatter is. And there's a player character. So there, there is the entity type, or the game object type for the player character, and it is, it is not exactly mirroring my, my key inputs. So I'm guessing that sometimes it will read the key inputs, and sometimes it will not, depending on how often it runs the the game update object tick, I guess. Wow, that's clever, isn't it? Okay, so let's put that poke all in one, and there we go, I pulled out Fluffy again. And I'm flying around with Fluffy and also my duplicate player character. Huh. That's clever. Okay, I love this player entity system. And then there's, and then there's the active and then there's another copy of me flying around with me oh my gosh the, the robot is shooting at me or was it shooting at the bird I don't know so look the duplicate player object is also uh, or it was also showing particle trails so the game is quite happily in inverted commas um, updating the particle trails for the other player character as well. That's great, isn't it? A lovely entity system in this game. Hmm. So we could 
experiment with a whole bunch of different um, inventory values, right? Let's try some high numbers, like how many 68s can we put in there? We'll put four 68s in there. Let's see what we get. It's a grenade. <laughs> I've given myself four grenades. Isn't that great? Let's fly away from that because that's really going to hurt when that explodes. No, too bad. Those seemed to be really nasty grenades as well. Let's try that again. Can I destroy? Oh gosh, can I destroy Fluffy? Oh, no. Okay. Ooh. Fluffy was another thing which popped up, so I'm guessing that I put the wrong number in for the number of inventory items. Maybe I didn't put a number. Maybe I didn't put enough grenades in the inventory and I pulled out a Fluffy instead. That would make sense. So I've got another Fluffy here now. One, two, three, four, five grenades. One, two. And then you can see the sprites are starting to drop out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think the sprites were starting to drop out. Maybe there is a multiplexer in here, but it was just overloaded, I think, because there was a fluffy, there was a, a player character or a or a crew member, there was the gun, there was a bullet, there was another crew member, there were those two grenades up safe in the room up there. I think there were definitely more than eight sprites. Or, or there were definitely more than eight sprite objects wanting to be visible in the same horizontal band and of course with the Commodore 64 you could only have a maximum of eight sprites in a horizontal band, really. So that's why it got a bit busy, and that's why some of the game objects dropped out. It's worth noting that those five grenades definitely killed the gun. Oh, look, another Fluffy. <laughs> okay, let's chuck Fluffy over there. There we are. Ah, and, and I think the duplicate player character was getting damaged by the explosion which was causing me to uh, do cartwheels. So anyway, um, this version of the game, I was just saving uh, the snapshot. One, two, three, four grenades. Let's change the object that we're going to spawn. Let's see what other, what other things. A flask, a full flask, a green thing. Of are these key cards? I think they're the keys. Let's go running over here and see what they were. This is the uh, RCD, probably a control thingy or something, remote control device. I'm guessing. Yep, the RCD remote control device at 40. So yeah, I'm, and that's the Canon activator, which is object 4F in the assembly listing there. But I didn't put 4F in there. So I think, I think the object IDs on the Commodore 64 version are quite a bit different, but laid out in a similar way there to the BBC Micro version. Uh, maybe the Commodore 64 version has a few extra objects, perhaps, or they're just there's just some space in the, or maybe it's just a diff slightly different version of Exile. I don't know. So uh, let's let's play around with different values. I guess five, six, seven, eight. That's where I left it last time, wasn't it? When I was counting up through the objects. A 
green impy thing, a purple impy thing, and I don't know, oh, there's a wasp's nest. <gasps> oh, no, that's, that's not, that's not good. I don't like the wasp's nest. Wasp's nests hurt because they spawn wasps, which get you. Okay. I wonder what nine is. What is nine? Hmm. Frog, frog, frog. <laughs> frog. Okay. Green frog man, I guess. So, because the object. Yeah, because the object IDs uh, don't match up with Commodore 64 and BBC Micro version, if I want to find the destinator, I'm going to have to go through all of them, I think, and just try and find it. Of course, once I get the destinator, I should be able to complete the game. We'll see. The destinator was the thing at the beginning of the game that was stolen by the person who was teleporting away. That's that's the story behind this game. Uh, it's in the instruction manual. So let's run through different values now. I think I overstepped the boundary of the uh, of the inventory. That looks like a bush. What on earth? And that's a yellow ball of slime? A yellow ball, maybe? Possibly? Uh, because I corrupted the inventory, I'm, I'm going back to the snapshot. There we go. Uh, bush. <laughs> okay. So, bush. And that's a yellow ball. And then there's a green, is that what's called a sucker? And then is the next one. Ooh, deadly sucker. Acid, in other words. Okay. That one really did hurt. Okay. And then F. Uh, one zero one 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 two uh, one three. Uh, is that too many again? No, should be fine. Uh, uh, pulsing yellow ball. Mm -hmm. Uh, really? And then a pulsing green ball. A uh, blue, a cyan ball. A okay, or light blue ball. Uh, a brown ball. A fish. Big fish. <laughs> oh look, the brown ball doesn't seem to like the fish. Oh! Bird egg? Maybe? I think it was making that sound when it was going to hatch? Maybe? Ah, so if you can hear sounds of munching or sounds of drinking then that's me I'm apologizing I've got I've got a beer and I've got some chocolate ginger cakey things here too because I'm a little bit peckish it's half past ten in the evening and I'm doing this and I need some brain energy obviously so let's keep on going up through the values see what we get That looks like a fish. And that looks like an exploding thing. Huh. Now that's an exploding thing. There's something like a cannonball or a blue death ball. But one six and a red bullet and a pistol bullet and a plasma ball. Hover ball. Invisible hover ball. Okay. Magenta robot, red robot. We should start seeing some robots, I'm guessing. Uh, if the game objects follow the rough ordering of this list. We'll get there, I suppose. Locked in my spaceship. Let's try some different values, see what we get. Whoa! Big expanded sprite. I have no idea what that was. Han. 
That's a gun. There's a green slime mold thing or whatever. And what is this? This is an alien gun. Well, yeah, evidently. P big cannon. <laughs> yeah, okay. Don't know how that was in my pocket. A uh, big rock. Uh, didn't you have to pick up the big rock to be able to weight you down to let you go down where the updraft was coming up, the vertical tunnel or something? Or to let you walk into the wind or something? I forget now. Full flask, empty flask. Yeah, so the game objects list definitely includes full flask and empty flask and the energy capital and the destinator. Also includes a oh maggot machine, the expanded sprite thing might have been the maggot machine I guess. There's a cannon, there's a rock there. I have a daft idea, can I can I use all of these grenades to blow up this door? The door is untouched. I think that's very sturdy door. You know, actually, I kind of prefer the colouring of this game with with the wrong colour being stored in, because you can actually see all of the horizontal bands, and it introduces a lot more colour in the game. Um, anyway, let's try with these values in the inventory. See what we get. Might as well. Uh, a big horizontal door. Well, that's useful in your pockets. Uh, okay. Uh huh. Horizontal stone door, perhaps? I don't know. I, th I think <laughs> because the door has not been correctly attached to uh, a key type in the map, then perhaps uh, when you pull out an a door object, it doesn't quite know how to render it properly, perhaps. Because you can stand on it and it says, I want a green key. Mm, yes. And now it's a yellow door. Oh, look. Okay, there's a big block and then there's an explosion. Mm. That's not the great, not the best thing to do, right? Mm. So, yes, putting explosions out of your pocket is probably not the best idea in the entire... Ooh, it's not just an explosion. It looks like it's a homing explosion or something. Yeah, that's not good. So let's look around objects around this again. Yeah. And that's a mushroom. And a fluffy fish thing. And a, I don't know what the, a crab. These are, these are various enemies that are in the game, obviously. Explosion B. Uh, yeah, that was a big explosion and it made the door go away. Wow. Okay. I went back to uh, snapshot. Um, uh, robots, and they don't like each other. Okay. They're shooting each other now. Great. Fantastic. So yeah, these don't like each other very much. And look, they're both flashing now, indicating that they're hurt. Another thing, and a really, and a, another robot, 
the doors disappeared, but I think that's the sprite limitations coming in again now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There is a multiplexer in this by the looks of it, but it, yeah, because I could see that the switch down there and the and the other robot was potentially also a sprite too, so. Okay, there's that angry person. The angry person teleported through the door when, oh, and there we go, the game crashed. Mm. Okay, let's go back. Try that again. Yep, person, more person, cow thing or whatever it is. Okay, and they're all rather angry at me. <laughs> hmm. Let's try that again, but with different objects. Thing, teleporting thing. Ah, that teleporting thing was the character that teleports out right at the beginning. So they it just teleport. It comes in and then teleports away straight away. Funny handler. What's these? What are these ones? Then? Imp. And what else? Imp. Another imp. And uh, I don't know what that is. And then the game crashed again. I don't think the game likes updating uh, so many objects. You see. A birdie, another birdie. Oh, and then the imp pushed me through with the door with the birdie, and now the robot is shooting me because I shouldn't be on this side of the door. So this is what I mean, is that if you were able to collect certain large numbers of enemies all in one place, and then you could try and get them to push you through the door, you see, without needing the door key. Which was kind of cool if you could get it to happen in the game, but you would often, or I often, spent a, a large amount of time trying to get this bug to happen. Whereas it was probably easier just to play through the game properly and to actually get the key properly. Hey ho, never mind. Let's let's give the robot a whole bunch of active grenades to play with. <laughs> um, and then of course remember this position behind the door by remembering the teleport position. Oh, so I, if, I, if I run out of energy, there we go, I teleport back here and I should be fine. And the robot has been destroyed by the key and it's, I don't know, an energy thing. Oh, it exploded. Okay. Anyway, there's a grenade. Another grenade. Uh, there's a table up there in the top right hand corner, I think, or something like that. So anyway, let's change tactics and let's use these different values here to see what we get. We've got a oh, big bird and a little bird and uh, another different bird, which is a little but a different colour. Okay, <laughs> let's go back to the snapshot again and let's go back to these values see what we get again get this a mushroom great uh, a, bu a bullet a lightning bolt and okay that's fine other values in let's just keep on methodically going up through these shall we rather than getting sidetracked um thing whatever that is uh, another thing it looks like a mushroom right it's got the mushroom effect so let's go back to the snapshot again and, and here we go, a wall, okay, and a piece of fire, and a thing, and a fruit, food, okay, looks like a pineapple, spiky thing maybe, hmm. dragon fruit perhaps, hmm. wall, door, I don't know what that is, okay, that looked like a wind effect thing or something perhaps anyway snapshot again back yes that's not helpful door also not helpful hmm. yeah i think i think 
I think these doors, they're, they're, they're the wrong key type. Oh, and this thruster effect or something. Look, it keeps on there and then it keeps on emitting particles as well, which is really intriguing. Okay, engine thruster. Okay. So we must be close to the destinator, right? So let's keep on going. Because these object numbers don't match up exactly. Bush, different types of ground or wall or something. Uh huh. An inflatable raft. A table. A button. <laughs> okay. Or a switch, rather. See, there's there's little bits of physics. A teleporter managed to teleport the table out of the way. <laughs> That's so funny. I pulled out a teleporter beam from my pocket and then teleported to some weird place in the map. I don't even recognise where it is. That is a bird. going. That's the cannon again. I've seen that one before, right? Rock. Mm -hmm. Next one would be the explosion. If the, if the ordering of these objects holds true. There we go. Explosion. And a chest. Okay. Let's keep on going. I can't type. There we go. A torch. Okay. Uh. Uh. I have no idea. Whatever. And? seems to be an alien gun, which might be the mysterious weapon. Placeholder might be the player character, I suppose. Hmm. Right. The destinator should have been there, right? Let's see. Let's just do 60, 61, 62, 63. Flask. Full flask. Hmm. Empty flask. Uh huh. That looks like the destinator. That is the destinator. Look, the hint comes down at the bottom of the screen. So, you know what I'm going to do with this? I'm going to fly the destinator. All the way back up to the top. All the way back up to the... No, I'm going to teleport. And I'm going to keep on teleporting. Until I get back to the spaceship. Here we go. Here we go. Teleporting would have been quicker than that. Right now. I don't need to carry that destinator up. Here we go. So, give me all of those things again. Mm-hmm. Flask, flask. Full flask, which... Aha! There we go. Carry the destinator into the right point of the spaceship, and the game ends. Game over. Well done. Uh, no crew rescued. I didn't rescue anyone. Mission over. Well done. No crew rescued. And my spaceship has flown off with me and I'm all fine and wonderful. And there we go. That's the game completed with a particular sheet mode for putting that item in your inventory. Completely. Oh, look. Hmm. Yeah, look. 
the spaceship comes back again. I think the level wraps around. At normal speed, it takes quite some time for it to wrap around. But of course, if you if you warp it, then of course the time is shorter because the emulator runs at about five times the speed it, it should do. Hmm. So yeah, let's put that in the debugging notes. Uh, let's see if we can narrow down. Let's go back to the spaceship. That's why I'm teleporting a lot. Here we go. Okay, that's definitely my last teleport position. So let's fill this with what number would it be? Well, let's just put one inventory item in there, which is 60. There's the destinator. And then, bing. Yep, well, there we go. That's the cheat code. You just do those two pokes, basically. Or that, yeah, two pokes. Put two different values into those two consecutive memory locations. And it gives you the inventory item in there. There you go. Isn't that, isn't that fantastic? And then this, yep, there we go. So yeah, that engine thruster effect is used for the top engine of the spacecraft look to boost you away from wherever you were in orbit, I guess. So I think we'll leave that there. Uh, I think I covered everything that I wanted to cover in this game. The scrolling, the cache sprite update, and also the inventory update and using the machine code monitor to to tweak your inventory if you like these kind of like crazy retro commodore 64 games uh, technical deep dive sessions then please do consider liking or subscribing to my channel and i will endeavor to add more videos like it have a great day wherever you are <laughs>